I propose to take seriously the, some of the, I mean, semi-seriously, um, the problems that are involved in attempting to create a better world by using rules and regulations to do so. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about one of my great hobbies, which is dystopian literature. You all know what dystopian literature is. Dystopia means a bad place, such as 1984, Orwell's novel, or Huxley's Brave New World, and other such. And I've been studying this kind of thing for a very long time. It's derived from Huxley's Brave New World in all kinds of particulars, including the fact that it's set, it's a 1993 film, it's set in a future which is stipulated to be 2032. Huxley's novel Brave New World was published in 1932, and so it's exactly 100 years later. The main character played by Sandra Bullock is called Lenina Huxley. Um, there are all kinds of names and puns and references um, to Huxley's work in this, in this novel, in this film. And the film kind of falls apart after the really amusing premise to begin with. Um, so I just want to read you a description of that film and why it was that I thought it was so wonderful and strongly recommended to everyone who is... Um, seriously concerned with how to make the world a better place. <laughs> um, as I said, I originally didn't see this kind of dystopian literature as being, as seriously addressing a problem that needed to be addressed. I thought that these writers like Bertha Thomas and Jerome K. Jerome were simply reactionaries and to be dismissed. And I taught utopian and dystopian literature, and still do for many years, and I probably use them for that purpose. Mea culpa. We learn the hard way. Um, but it did become clear to me over the years that these texts, which I knew, were beginning to resemble reality. No, it's the other way, right? And one of the problems is that nowadays, as you probably know from your own experiences in your universities, it's become extremely hard to parody reality. That in itself is actually very hilarious if you bother to it. But it does create a problem for creative writers. So I think that if you're, you know, when you're feeling really that you've had it, think, think about parody. You may not know what you can do until you've tried. And even Hollywood clearly has entered uh, this particular struggle. And this 1993 film, Demolition Man, uh, as I said, is based on Huxley's novel very clearly. Um, as befitting a film made 60 years after Brave New World, it extends Huxley's satire of a perfectly managed future to the point where total and constant monitoring of individuals touches every aspect of life. Nothing so crude as the telescreens in Orwell's 1984 appears in the film. Rather, organically bioengineered <laughs> microchips are sewn into everybody's skin. And these devices code people so that they can be tracked wherever they are. I'm sure by now this, is, this technology exists, and for all we know, it's already in us. <laughs> it's in our iPhones. What? It's in our iPhones. Oh, okay. Well, they're not yet body, body parts, but I'm sure they will be very soon. <laughs> Actually, for a very long time, I've thought that the obvious solution to the telephone problem is for every infant to have embedded into them a port which would give them lifelong <laughs> access to everything they need. <laughs> Believe me, there's nothing we can think of that is not going to happen before too long. Okay. Um, in the film, these microchips allow people to be tracked wherever they are. Police have become almost entirely unnecessary because as the Sandra Bullock character says with great dismay. You remember, she's a sort of buff for 20th century uh, culture and crime scenes and so on, and is not a happy member of her future society. She says, things don't happen anymore, which is largely true in that film, as the warden of a cryogenic prison also says with satisfaction. Everyone can go to CompuChat machines on the street for instant therapy and cheering up telling you how valuable you are. And any kind of offensive language causes the omnipresent computers, which are on every street corner, to automatically find the individual one or more credits and announce it publicly in a monotonous computer voice. In the future California, no one has died from unnatural causes in 16 years, and the police don't have the vaguest notion of how to respond to a code 187 called a murder death killed uh, in the in the film 
but when following the demands of the plot, a murder does occur for the first time in more than 20 years. Attempting to deal with a killer from our time who's escaped from his cryogenic prison, and that's why then the Stallone character is released from his cryogenic prison. He was a kind of um, rogue cop okay, uh, in order to catch him. Uh, this killer escapes from his imprisonment, and the computer provides the police with such pieces of advice as, with a firm tone of voice, demand maniac to lie down with hands behind back. <laughs> this is, of course, ineffective, which is where St Sylvester Stallone comes in, using a defamiliarization technique typical of utopian novels and films in which a person from our own time reacts with amazement to the newly encountered future. It's a very, very effective device. All of the Star Trek films play with that device, and I, I think it's fabulous. It's called defamiliarization or estrangement. It makes you see the familiar in a new way. It's also considered a major function of art to do exactly that. Um, using this defamiliarization device, the film makes our hero inadvertently contravene all of the norms of this new society, which he, of course, knows nothing about, this perfect society. In Brave New World, Aldous Huxley had written a wonderful line, and I suggest you all put, put, fix this in your memory. It will come in very, very useful. There isn't any need for a civilized man to, be, to bear anything that's seriously unpleasant. <laughs> there isn't any need for a civilized man to bear anything that's seriously unpleasant. Demolition Man extends that principle, as we learn that whatever is not good for people is considered bad, and for this reason has been made illegal. The list includes alcohol, caffeine, contact sports, meat, offensive language, chocolate, anything spicy, gasoline, uneducational toys, abortion, but also pregnancy if you don't have a license. <laughs> not only is reproduction state-controlled and managed hygienically in laboratories, but as a result of AIDS and other epidemics, body contact has been proscribed. Sexual pleasure is achieved through direct brain stimulation via matching headsets. <laughs> at one point, Lenina exclaims with disgust at Stallone's idea of sex. Don't you know what the exchange of bodily fluids leads to? He replies, yeah, I do. Kids, smoking, a desire to raid the fridge. <laughs> so successfully does the film convey the sense of life in a completely regulated society, at least to a utopia's junkie like me, that on hearing this line, I actually felt a touch of nostalgia. <laughs> now, the beauty of a literary utopia, or dystopia, or utopian satire, or however we want to consider these categories, is that it presents us with a living image of the way a society might function if it had certain rules and regulations. And it seems as though we're losing that sense, that sense of amazement or of being startled at the things that are going on around us because we've become so inured to the everyday uh, aggravation that we have to put up with. So, although I can't tell you how to keep fighting the battle that presumably brings you here for this conference, um, except to stay cool, keep your energy up, and um, refrain from physical violence, <laughs> I do think that Acquaintance with the very, very powerful dystopian tradition is a powerful and really useful tool. People need to somehow be forced to start thinking about, they're thinking in terms of the ends justify the means, but what they really need to be thinking about is the kind of reality that in itself becomes the end once certain means are adopted. And we're well on the way toward that. And your struggle, I think, like mine, is to try to figure out uh, how to stay sane, keep your energy up, respond to this reality without caving in, and possibly have some effect on your fellow students and administrators while fighting this good fight. But it's not going to be easy. Thank you.